Kings Leo Kunko is a specialist when it comes to relationships and marriages with over two decades hands-on experience as a pastor, relationship coach, counsellor, TV personality and best-selling author with over hundreds of thousands of followers across social media amounting to millions of views on his relationship teachings. Kings Leo Kunkwa is a presidential member of the American Association of Christian Counselors, a board certified master's Christian life coach, and a certified relationship counselor. He is also an advanced certified marriage counselor and family life coach. PK continues to be a blessing through itinerant relationship seminars, conferences, and counseling sessions across the world. Ladies and gentlemen, One Church, please welcome Pastor Kings Leo Kunkwa. We've received your questions, and we're going to go straight into the Q&A sessions and session. So for that, I have the privilege of inviting, again, Pastor Kingsley Okoko. Again, do it like you mean it, please. <laughs> right. Just to test that your mic is working, sir. Okay. <laughs> it's worked. Okay, so when you were speaking, we asked, we asked for questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I would like to start with the, the very first one that we got. So, <laughs> why is it very hard to find love in church? Our ladies in church are so rigid and difficult to approach or communicate with. So, someone here asked this question, right? And I, I'm very, you know, we're reviewing that. I'm just curious to hear what you'd say about that. Okay. Um, the interesting thing about marriage and relationships is that um, you must constantly try not to generalize things. Um, Sometimes what's happening to people, what's happening like in this case now is that there is something clearly wrong with either your way of reading the situation or with the kind of people you are interacting with. So when people tell me things like all men are bad, the issue is not with men. I have a problem with why are you picking these toxic men? There must be something about you constantly attracting these men. So if you're saying girls don't interact, that's not the idea I have, even from my one day of speaking here. I don't think all these ladies don't interact. So it's either are you approaching them correctly? Are they avoiding you? You know? Or are you talking to people that don't like you? <laughs> because there are people like that, always chasing somebody that doesn't like you. So you, you can't put all the women in this church in one box. I don't think it's true. Or in any church. I feel we need to work on what are you expecting, how are you approaching them, your manner of approach, like they say. Um, is it okay? And um, are you even talking to people that like you? So, again, this is another thing I want to, talk, to tell, tell young people. Your job is not to force people to treat you a certain way. When people treat you in the way you don't like, they have answered you. They have given you the answer. So don't start now rotating or personalizing the issue. Saying all oh, women, that women. No, no, no. If these girls you're talking to are not giving you the positive, you're talking to the wrong girls. It might not be that something is wrong with them. It might not even be that something is wrong with you. It's just that two of you shouldn't be the, in this transaction. Look for somebody. There. there must be somebody in this world that likes you. Maybe you are just constantly chasing the wrong kind of relationships. So you can't generalize all the women here that you interact that it's hard to find love in church. No. I need to sit down with you and find out what's even your idea of love. What are you looking for? I'm looking for girls that don't, are not interested in you. I told you that I met some ladies before I met my wife. Some were not interested in me at all. I didn't say all these women in this church now I don't know. I, I went for um, 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 DLA um, is the, on this start, the Leadership Academy. Um, and I went there and I said, okay, this is a church setting. It's a good place to find a wife. And I was a young pastor looking for a wife badly then. So um, as I entered, as I was doing my lecture, I was looking around, okay, where are the fine girls, where are the fine girls? And I saw one girl that looked interesting. She looked nice. Now, it wasn't love at first sight. I, I, don't, I didn't love her, okay? But she looked nice because there's a natural process that a relationship follows. Something must attract you. 
But that attraction is not love. You must just identify it as attraction. You like the way she sings. That's attraction. It's not that, it doesn't mean you are going to marry. Because some people from there jump from, they're already picturing wedding day. Mm-mm. Some people are already naming their children. Mm-mm. Attraction is okay. It's not wrong, but don't turn it to love. Don't say it's love. It's not love. So I was attracted to somebody. I said, okay. So I changed my seat because she was in one end of the hall. I was in the other end of the hall. Because, you know, everybody have where they sit every day. When I sat out, I changed my geography. Moved to her side of the hall. Sat close enough to her. And I started with a neutral conversation. Um, did you get the notes for the last class? Can I copy your note? There's no yes, there's no... You see, men don't know how to approach women. If you're a woman you've never met before, you really don't know, don't start with, I love you. Can I have your number? Can I... Don't start with those strong things. Except she's a woman that is seriously looking for a man too, and any man. If she's a normal woman that has a life, doing something with her life, you can't just start from nowhere, I love you, I want to marry you next week. No. Start with something neutral that is easy for everybody to flow in. Oh, how are you? Okay, good. Do you stay around here? Um, will I get a bus from here? What, what's the nearest, whatever, basic stuff? So I said, can I borrow your note? And we started talking. Oh, what's your name? Uh, stop. We started talking. Now, I began to, oh, follow up. Get, let me get your number. Let's talk. Now, but from the discussion, I could see that she wasn't looking at me in that light at all. She wasn't giving any positive vibes. And I was not upset at all. I didn't turn it to all these women in this school. And No. She has answered. And I just fizzled out. No quarrel, no, we didn't have any. I could just see that. See, all you do in relation to present yourself, if a person can't see value in you, there is not a bad thing. It's even good that they are even honest enough to, to tell you. What I see most young people do is that they pre- people, one of the most common emails or DMs I receive is, Pastor, hey, this guy doesn't want me again. I will die. What? Or my girlfriend wants to leave me. Uh, she said, and I don't want her to leave. I said, no. You can't not not want her to leave. That's the, if somebody, uh, <laughs> there's a recent one. The guy said, oh, my, 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 my girlfriend wants to take a break. Pastor, please, I don't want this relationship to end. I said, no. That's not the right stance. If somebody wants to take a break, your concern should be why do they want to take a break? Not that, no, please don't ever leave me. No, no, you're not just too funny. They can leave you. Are you here, somebody? Don't say, don't leave me. You know, that's the idea, but don't leave me. No, 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 no. If somebody says, I want to take a break, your job is going to say, please, this thing must work at all costs. No, 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 no. Why do you want to take a break? And she, the, the lady took a break, and now, and the guy all the while was agitated. Pastor, please, I don't want this girl to go. I said, that's the wrong thinking. And the girl now came back and said, okay, let's continue. I said, and you've continued. He said, yes. I said, no. What you should do is, why did you take the break? Now that you've come back, has that issue been resolved? If it hasn't been resolved, she will take a break in marriage. Because if that issue is still there, it's still going to be there. It will show up in marriage. Like I told you, no marriage fails in marriage. For any marriage that has failed, if I, help, if I ask questions, I will find out that they had failed before it started. She took a break. That means she's not feeling, she says she's not feeling the relationship. And the guy was so sad. I said, that's not a sad thing. That's a good thing. If somebody tells you at this point that they're not feeling the relationship, it's good. Because you deserve to love somebody that loves you too. Not that please love me at all costs. It doesn't matter what you feel. As long as you love me, I love you. You, 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 can, you can manage me. No. I want somebody that loves me the way me too, I love them. I want somebody that wants me the way me too, what? Wants them. Not just, hey, stay at all costs. I say, no. Don't jump back with her into a relationship. Find out why she took the break at all. She wasn't feeling the relationship. So what has changed? Why are we sure 10 years into marriage, 5 years into marriage, or even next week, or even next month, you won't have feel, have, get this feeling of detachment again? But the guy has already jumped back into the relationship. He's so happy. I said, that, that's already a recipe for failure. There's something going on there that will show up. Tomorrow she might date somebody else even why she's married because she says she's not in love with you from day one. I don't know if somebody's getting what I'm saying. So your job is not to push at all costs is that if you keep presenting your people and nobody's valuing you, maybe you should upgrade yourself or change the people you are presenting yourself to. That's it. Thank you very much, sir. Yeah, I think we should always appreciate the answers when we get them, right? So there's another one here. There were two questions from two people, but they seem to tie into the same thing. So I'm bunching them together. One says, how do you get over or manage the impact and influence of your past relationship or the impact they've already have on you, yeah, since they find their way into your new relationships. And then number two, this person said, 
it was a more personal question. He says he just ended a 10-year relationship and the person and couldn't get into any other relationship because when you want to start, somehow he just struggles to continue in that relationship. And apparently from the way the question is asked, it seems the other person seems to be encountering the same thing. So what's your advice to them? So those are two people's questions. Who is the other person? Um, the person that he was dating, wow. the ten-year relationship. Why, why does he keeping track of what the other person is doing? I, well, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the key is this: um, don't be reluctant or hesitant to talk to a professional or a marriage coach. And I know that sometimes some might be a bit expensive, but there, there are some that are still quite affordable. And sometimes, if you don't even get a professional, there are some people in church like your pastor or other people in church that are a bit equipped to do so. Please take advantage of it. When you go through things like this, sometimes you need people to bounce off to help you ask questions that you probably are. You, you see, when you are hot, you're not thinking, you're, you, how like When you're going through something, you are seeing life from just that thing you are going through. You're not seeing that there's a bigger picture. If somebody gets what I'm saying, life is more than this one situation, this one, one girl, this one experience. So you need to expose yourself to the bigger picture. Talking to a professional will help. Other things you can do is, you know, um, this relationship didn't work. What were the things we did wrong or I did wrong? Because if you can't identify those things, there's a high chance you can repeat these mistakes again. I've seen it over and over again. People leave one bad marriage or one bad relationship to go to this. They couldn't identify. They blamed all the faults was the other person's fault. There's no time that all the faults are the other person's fault. Even when you didn't do anything outrightly, maybe you didn't value yourself enough. If somebody gets what I'm saying. If two people date and one was a demon, the question is why did the angel stay with a demon? That might be what you did wrong. You didn't offend the guy, but you didn't also value yourself. There are, there are points long ago you should have ended that thing and you thought you wanted to stay with the demon until the demon started manifesting full blown. Are you getting what I'm saying? That's assuming you want to say it's the right person that did all this thing wrong. You staying there. You picking that person. What were you looking... What, what did you miss that made you commit your life to this person? I don't know if you're getting what I'm saying. So there's so much. A professional will help you ask these questions more systematically. But if you want to do it yourself, then you must be willing to pour yourself into learning why it happened. Um, forgive yourself. Forgive that person. You are not forgiving that person because they deserve to be forgiven. You are forgiving that person because you deserve a second chance. Somebody get what I'm saying? Please, my water. <clears throat> because, so let me drink water. Because if you don't forgive the person, you are not imprisoning the person. You are actually imprisoning yourself. So there are little processes like that you need to go through that will help you overcome, you know, what you have been through. So identify what you did wrong. Identify, you know, what you would change in your next relationship. Forgive and cut off. And bother that you are still checking what the other person... You can't move forward if you're always looking at the rearview mirror. So you have to f cut off. Throw away things that they gave you as gifts. All those things that are reminding you. You are still reading their text, reading their chat, checking on them on Instagram, whether they have a new boyfriend or girlfriend. Mm. You have to block them on all platforms. Not because they are wicked, but you see, you are trying to heal. Them being in your space. Don't, don't answer anybody that says, let's break up, but let's still be friends. That energy will still be there. And what people don't realize is that you give out energy. Many of you, the energy you are giving to people is that you're occupied. You are in love with somebody that is not even in love with you. So when new people are coming, you're not even seeing them. Because you are in love with this guy that is not even ready to marry you. I don't know if you're getting what I'm saying. So there's a whole lot of process you must go through. Forgiving yourself, forgiving the person, going through a healing process. It's a long process. It's not something we can just do here. All right? It's a whole chain of things. But you need to heal properly. If you don't heal properly, definitely to affect your next relationship. So, sir, just to tie into that, yeah, there's something else that is also personal here. I was engaged to be married. We broke up, and he married someone else after six months. Yes. This broke me, and since then, it was never the same for me. Because of this, I don't even know what real love is. Because we were good together, prayed together, planned together, and so on. Now, I'm consciously looking for this in a partner who will fill his space. But I keep meeting the wrong guys. How do I break out of this? Most of you need, in this kind of cases, to be honest with you, you still need a professional somehow. Or somebody a bit trained. Some, when people say things like, oh, it was so perfect. Most times it's not true. 
I've counseled people that came out broken relationships. They say, what's and when I began to analyze the relationship, I said, what's perfect about this? Why are you okay with this kind of toxic behavior? Like I told that girl that they, they wiped with cord. <laughs> she didn't leave. See, women particularly, even men do it, but women are more um, creative in the, mentally when it comes to love. They have a way of fading out all the negatives and focusing on one small thing he's doing right. I say, he's perfect. No, he's not. No, he's not. The fact that the relationship didn't work is your answer. If it was perfect, he would be there. If you could find somebody in six months, trust me, you didn't miss anything. You didn't miss anything. You should be thanking God that this thing didn't work. Because a broken relationship is better than a broken marriage. All you need to do is to change your perspective of the situation. Your perspective right now is that you are missing so much. This guy is so wonderful. Somebody else has married him. Somebody else has inherited a problem. See it like that. And for young people, you must learn the wedding is not the marriage. I've said it over and again. Many of you just say, if somebody is married, he has married somebody else. Wait. Just give it some time. It takes a lifetime to know the marriage that is working on. Oh, did you get what I said? I said it takes how long? A lifetime. Some things you are saying is happily married. Tell you, how, how many, someone like Bill Gates is divorced. Do you know how many years he was married? About 27 years. So somebody, 10 years, I said, eh, eh, this is not Bill Gates, not my happily married. You don't know that. You don't know that. If it was the, the, in 20 years, somebody said, they've been married for 20 years. It's successful. You don't know that. You don't know that. You are not in anybody's house. So the only thing you know is that if this guy treated you badly, if this guy can break up with your man in six months, you have missed nothing. God just delivered you from a joker. That's what happened. So a change of perspective is all you need. Once your perspective changes, you will live there happier than sadder. You are sad now because you think you've missed something. You've missed nothing. I've cancelled people that, that have gone through a breakup. They are focusing on one, one good thing. I said, but look at the nine bad things God delivered you from. You are saying the one good thing is that he buys me ice cream after church <laughs> every Sunday. That's the only thing you're holding on to. But the fact that he abuses you, the fact that he cheats on you, the fact that he beats you, the fact that he's never there when you need him, all those nine other bad things. People have a way of just, when you're in pain, just narrow down to the one thing and you forget the reality. All right? So give it some time. Stop dwelling. Stop dwelling on what is gone. Start looking out for what God has out, out there. Our friend always says that God's best is never in the past. It's never in the past. What God needs to make a good future for is still available. God is never handicapped or run out. Or he never runs out of resources. He will give you somebody that is deserving of you. Amen. <laughs> All right. Yeah, always feel free to come. Feel free. Um, okay, so this one is one I've heard a lot of times. So when I saw it here, I said, okay, we're going to ask this question. Yeah. I'm self-employed. And there are good times and bad times. My thinking is, I need something more stable and regular. I need something more stable and irregular income before committing to anyone. However, older people like relatives keep saying it's wiser to have someone now before being comfortable since I am, in quotes, getting old. How do I balance this? Especially since we live in times where a man's worth plays a major role for most ladies. Beautiful question and it's a common question and... Um, it's usually something I even normally address in my teaching like this. So thank you for asking this question. The blessing, the favor that will move your life to the next level usually comes after the marriage, not before. And many young guys think, I want to get all my favor going before I marry. No. The Bible says he that finds a wife, finds a good thing, then he obtains favor. There is a favor that a woman, a good woman, brings into your life. The Bible says a virtuous woman is a crown to her husband's head. What does this mean? What does the crown do to a normal man? I can't hear you. What does the crown do to a normal man? Makes him a king. So it's the wife coming into your life that brings you to your kingship on your throne. So marry now. As long as you're of age and you have something you are doing. You don't have to be rich. The problem with us in this part of the world is that we are pressuring ourselves. Or ourselves. We think I must live in a certain area. I must drive a certain car. Listen, your life will transition so much when you marry. A time will come, you remember, you won't remember this stage. If somebody gets what I'm saying. When I married my wife, I had no natural source of income. Now, I had a job. You must get a job, okay? I'm not talking about a loafer. You must be doing something. All right? So the Bible is clear. God gave Adam work first before he gave me a wife. So it's standard. You must have a job. However, the level you are at that job will vary. 
Some will already be big in what they are doing. Some will be starting. For me, I was just starting. So I was a young pastor. My church couldn't even afford to pay me a salary. But I was, I had a, I had, I was already a pastor. The ministry had stuff. We were already in the venue. We were doing well. We are doing okay. But I knew that a woman coming will help. You see, when God says it's not good for man to be alone, he knows what he's, he knows, he knows what he's saying. He's saying, look, your success and productivity will be ma- multiplied when a woman enters your life. So what you're actually asking for will happen when you find a good woman. The only challenge is some men go and find a fine woman, mm-hmm. not a virtuous woman. They go and find a sexy woman, not a virtuous woman. The Bible says a virtuous woman is a crown. So you need to find the right kind of... Once it's a good woman, you find. He that finds or finds a good thing. Once a good woman, you find. I put it to you, it's impossible. Women are fertile ground. They're incubators. They, they came with a womb. Not only a physical womb, but an emotional womb, a spiritual womb. And the way they are created, they are created to multiply. Once you plant a seed inside a woman, whether it's a seed of a child or a seed of a dream, she gives birth. Are you here, somebody? She was created to do that. So when you find all my dreams, all my dreams didn't start to manifest at the level that they, they should until my wife came into the picture. I had books I had not written until she came. Those books became a reality. I had dreams to go on TV until she came. It became a reality. A lot of my dreams started manifesting when my wife came. So I don't joke with her. I don't joke with her. There's nothing I can't do for her. Are you here, somebody? So the point is that as a young man, don't wait till you are so rich. Like, this, like your elders tell you, it's a good advice. When you are very rich, many people will like you for the wrong reasons. Anybody that will see you, like you now and believe in you now is the kind of person you need in your life. So marry now. Marry immediately. Marry this year. <laughs> Just make sure it is what? A virtuous woman, a good woman. So that's the challenge. People rush and go and marry nonsense. And now, it's not guess The woman will not be complaining. We don't have life. We don't, no, no. You are marrying a woman that understands that we are building together. Like I said, I was saying that I married my wife. I didn't have a salary. But till tomorrow, we've been married for 17 years. My wife has never once said we don't have, I'm see all my mates have. Mm-mm. When we married, we had nothing. No salary. I had no salary. She was just finishing her master's. So we had no natural source of income together as a couple. We're living by faith. Now, I had a job. Don't get me wrong. Like I said, we're living by faith. Somehow we're surviving. There are times we didn't have soap to have our bath. There are times we didn't have toothpaste to brush. There are times I was even on TV because the ministry can be rich and you as a pastor you are not rich. People don't know that. People assume that church money is pastor's money. I laugh at you. It doesn't work that way. So w- our ministry was even on TV but we didn't have soap to bath. We used to gather those pieces of soap that remains from bath soap and join it together to, to have our bath. We used to cut toothpaste in the middle and scrape inside for, for weeks. We didn't have anything. We didn't have food. The many times we didn't have food. So we went through the stages. But today the story is different. The story is very, very different. But the point is that she never stressed me even then once. Because she knew we were building together. She believed in the dream we had. She believed in me. This is time to know the woman that believes in you. That's what you're even looking for. If she believes in you, you will flourish. She will come and look at those dreams that you have and say, this is how we'll do it. And you must listen to her when you marry a good man. Because on that thing again, some men marry good women, but they don't listen to them. So they keep making those bad decisions. The whole idea of marriage is that two heads are better than one. Pity read that earlier today. The whole concept of people marrying is that we are getting more resources together in one place. So if you marry a woman and you're not going to listen to her, you are wasting the marrying her. Let somebody else marry her. Because what's the use of us increasing? It's like, it's like me, um, I, I start a choir and only me still want to play all the instruments. No, the whole point of getting a keyboard is, is so that somebody else can play the keyboard while I'm playing the guitar and somebody else is playing the drum. So I get a drum and a keyboard and I say, all of you sit down. Only me will play all of them. And I run, I play drum, I come back, play guitar. And I go, that's what many men are doing. If you, don't, if you know you're not going to let that woman contribute, don't marry her, leave her. Don't marry her and keep her quiet and say, don't. Women have a way they see life. And two of us seeing from those two different perspectives will bring a more balanced way. And you'll see progress in your life. Oh, you, you guys. <laughs> it's good, right? It's good, right? All right, all right. So this one is a very short question. Yeah, it's a very curious question. Is it okay to have all the five love languages as your love language? And it's not like it's a crime, but it's just not normal. <laughs> it's not normal. So usually you will have some that are more important. But you see, human beings can't be put in a box all the time. So it's possible that you say you like all five, but usually it's not so. Usually it's not so. You will like some more than others. When they say love language, it doesn't mean you don't like the other things. It just means that we're looking for the one that is most important. If somebody get what I'm saying? That's all it is. And I know, I know it's not everybody that is here or that is watching that will know the five love languages. 
Um, it, it, one of my mentors called Dr. Gary Chapman developed a theory and a teaching from his counseling sessions over the years uh, that human beings have five major love languages and all other ones come under it. A love language is a language of love a person understands. It's like your native dialect, all right? All of us can have different native dialects. So you must know what language, what you need to do to this person to make them feel loved. Because people are different. I, somebody can like ice cream, and that person likes me to come and sweep for them. So you can't say, my ex-girlfriend, after I bought her ice cream, she's happy. Then your new girlfriend, is not giving her ice cream also. No. You must find out what each person sees as love. So there are five major ones. There's giving of gifts. There's non-sexual touch. All right? There's um, f- uh, quality time. There's words of affirmation. And there's um, acts of service, doing something for the person. So everybody has their, f- those are five. People have ones that are more important to them, all right, than the other. Okay, so um, you need to find out your spouse's one and make sure you keep doing it. But you, you can have all five, but one will still be more strong than the others. Okay, thank you, sir. This person asks two questions. If dating shouldn't take too long before it leads to marriage, yes. then would it be right to conclude that singles shouldn't go into relationships except they are ready for marriage? And then two, wouldn't going into a relationship with an early understanding that it would lead into marriage rob both individuals of the f- friendship phase and put them under pressure? Beautiful question. Dating itself is a whole service on its own. Um, the first question is that... Yeah, if dating shouldn't take too long, then shouldn't they... Is, is it right to assume that you shouldn't go into a relationship until you're ready for marriage? Exactly. You shouldn't date just for dating sake. Again, that's another thing, making people not marry. Because now these people are dating for dating sake. Let's just see how it goes. No. No. Remain as friends until you feel this is going somewhere. So the real concept of dating, that's why we in the body of Christ, we call it more of courtship. We don't use dating. Because dating is a very loose word, loose term. If somebody says, I want to date you, and they date for five years, and they break your heart. They've not, they've not done anything wrong. Because they say, we, we are just dating now, and we have the date. <laughs> the date has expired. As rich. <laughs> has expired. <laughs> you see, so that was, you know, see, enough things are entering. I wish, I wish we could just educate people more. So you don't start a relationship if you don't know where it's going. Let's just be friends. Say, oh, how are you? What are the things you want to do in a dating relationship that you won't do in friendship? What are the things you want? Except you want to be kissing yourself. And having sex. If you're not doing that, then it's just talking. You're going to be talking. That's the same thing you do in friendship. Just be friends. Oh, how are you? We can go to cinema together. We can go and eat together. That's fine. In the course of all that, hanging out, talking, coming to church. Oh, how was church on Sunday? What did you do? In the course of that, I will know if this is the kind of person I want to spend the rest of my life with. If not, I keep that friendship as friendship. Listen, it's not everybody that enters your life that is for marriage. Some are your business partners. Some will link you to somebody important in your life. But unfortunately for young people, we date everybody. It's either it's date or hate. <laughs> that what young people do. If you're not dating me, I'm meeting you. So we date everybody, not knowing that sometimes we've lost important relationships. Once you date and you ex that person, you have blocked that road forever. And some of them are important people. You're there. Maybe when they, a new job opening comes in the office, they would have brought you in, but you have dated them. <laughs> and you've broken up. Some of them say they will link you to their brother or their cousin that you will now marry. But you have dated this one. Only to not find out he is not, he has no future ambition. He's not going anywhere with his life. You can't marry him. Boy, and his brother is not interested. He probably not find out that he has slept with you or you guys have dated before. And, he, and I'm telling you, I've can't, pity, I've, I've cancelled somebody like that. One beautiful girl outside the country. I went for a program and she came for cancelling. Beautiful girl, smart girl. She, she had think she was doing masters or doing PhD that time. Incredibly smart. Everything was good about this girl. Only challenge. She had a relationship. Nice guy to great guy. The only challenge was that in her early days, she had had a fling with the guy's younger brother. They didn't even date. They just had a fling. Long ago. But now, she's in a relationship with her, the elder brother. They're, about, they're thinking of marriage, but that's the stalling issue. The guy knows that he had something with his, sister, with his brother. Do you see why you can't just be dating everybody you see every road? It can, it can affect you. And this is just marriage. Business. Different things. Many of you, job and opportunities. Many things you are blocking the road because you dated somebody that should have been your friend. When you make people your friends, that way you keep the relationship intact. Once both of you are friends long enough, you can know that, okay, this thing is just good as friendship. It shouldn't go beyond this. And if it looks like what will go beyond this is defined from day one. Look, I'm not here for dating. This is where we are going. See, what makes it dating? Dating is not a destination itself. Dating is just the vehicle from when we start the relationship to when we marry. 
It's not as if it's a destination. So when you start dating and say, I want to date you, do where? I'm not dating anyway. I'm asking you out. Where am I? No. We want to get married, yes. But the process from when we agree to get married to when we do get married, that's what the dating or courtship is. So it's not a destination for itself. It's not a official. You don't ask people to keep them in waiting. No. I don't even know what I'm saying. When you're at the airport, you, do, you, 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 don't, you don't pay for boarding. You don't pay for waiting. You pay for the flight. But from when you pay for the flight to when the flight is, you wait. I don't know if you get what I'm saying. But the waiting is not what you paid for. So that, but this is what young people are doing. They go to the airport. Say, I'm waiting. When is your flight? <laughs> I don't have flight. <laughs> we are just here. They say, people can wait here. That's what young people are doing. There is a flight. The flight is fixed. The time is fixed. But I'm just waiting for the boarding call. I don't know if you get what I'm saying. So, of course, remain friends till you feel this can be something. When it's not something, it means I don't have to damage this relationship. We can still be friends. We don't have to be my ex. Some of you, your exes are too much. I'm one of your friends. You have more exes in your life than friends. When God wants to bless you, it's your friends he will use. If you don't have relationships in your life, it's difficult for God to get across information or things to you. So, be friends till you are ready to marry. Once you're ready to marry, the friendship can be as long as possible. But once you're ready to marry, the dating itself shouldn't be long because you should be ready, you know where you're going. So anything from six months to one year, depending on your age and how long you guys have known before that time. Now, if you've never known yourself for that time and you just quickly start a relationship, you have to date for longer because you didn't know yourself before. But if you have known yourself for a long time, you've been friends. Dating itself is not a thing. We're not, dating courtship is not a destination. It's just from when me and you agree to marry, but we want to marry next year, December. So by default, we're going to wait till next year, December. It's not that we started a relationship to wait. No. I don't know if you get what I'm saying, guys. I wish I, so that's what's keeping young people. So somebody dating for three years, no, no destination. They've reached where they are going. They've reached where they are going. Now, dating is where I'm going. We have reached. Where are you already shutting to? We are dating. Seven years, five years. What? People have studied medicine, studied law. <laughs> you have studied man, still with no certificate. Still with no certificate. No, 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 no. So you start a relationship, build friendships. From your friends, you will know who can survive as your spouse. Somebody that can make it as a friend can make it as your spouse. Since the time of friendship, you discover we are compatible, we think alike, we are headed the same way. Then we move to a relationship, which you now move to a marriage. So yes, you shouldn't date just for dating's sake. It should be with purpose from beginning. That way nobody wastes anybody's time. Thank you very much, sir. So this, this last question ties into another one I saw here beautifully. So it says, um, sir, I've been in a relationship for like four years now. Right, we have no issues, but the parents keep giving conditions before us getting married or before we get married. We had agreed on a date, and her father came up with she must get a better job. As we speak, we don't know when. I am tired. What's your advice, sir? Okay, as a standard again, guys, and I wish more people can listen to these things. Even though people people stress us by not listening and coming back to to you know bring cases that we should have solved before it started. Please, if you're a born-again Christian, you attend a good church like this one, before you even start a relationship, involve your pastor. It's like playing a football match without a referee, saying we love ourselves. Arsenal and Chelsea, we are both London's teams. We don't need a referee. Let's just play it with love. It's a love game. I trust you. You trust me. That would be, that, before before half time, you will, they will send you blues. There has to be a referee. There has to be authority higher than both of us. It's a good practice to have. Because a, a, a counselor would have, dis, people have dis, would have discussed these kind of things before you, you start saying, oh, is the parents wants to get a better job? No, no, no. Is the, the person, the man there, is he man enough? I'm bothered that his parents are dictating things like this. What qualifies you to want to be married is that you're ready to leave your father and your mother. That's the principle in Genesis. Therefore, Shall a man leave his father and his mother? This one I'm seeing that you're mentioning, you know, I'm not sure he's ready to leave his father and his mother. He still wants them to help him choose, to help him marry. No. No. All right? Um, he should decide what he wants. Two of you should decide. Again, this way a mentor and a counselor comes in. You should have had your clear date. This dating four years, I'm already bothered. It looks like you guys might stay under four years. The body language is not great. That's what I'm saying. That I don't like all this dating. You just stay indefinitely. Nobody decides to date for 10 years. Things just, the lack of planning. You see, like they say, when you fail to plan, you plan to fail. When there's no clear plan where we're going, four years, they're still asking you for a story. After you get better, you should get better complexion. 
I'm telling you, things, things will just keep coming up. So this guy should put his foot on the ground, make it clear that this is, what, this is our life. Yeah, they can say, go and do your master's. I'm telling you, this is the kind of thing that goes on. So make it clear what we want. He should be man enough to decide. And like I said, sometimes when your physical parents are giving you problems, I always ask, what are your spiritual parents saying? This is why you have pastors and spiritual parents. It's not just for, it's not in fashion. They provide guidance. They, they bring the spiritual dimension of the guidance to you. So what are they saying? Do they really have a point? Because sometimes, though, your parents do have valid reasons to be worried. That's why I said I would like a neutral party like your pastor to look at the same case. Sometimes, your parents really have concern and you have not presented yourself in a way that they can have faith in you. But ideally, if you want to marry, the principle is that you must be ready to leave father and mother. So if they're still making this level of decisions in your life, I'm bothered about how ready that guy is. And this influence and interference won't stop just because you say I do. This thing sounds like they will continue yeah. trying to run your marriage. So draw the line. And if he can't stand his ground, you might have to think of moving on. Again, this is why four years is much. Because when, when a girl has been somewhere in four years, she's not trying to leave. She's looking at, I've already invested four years of my life. Let me invest on that four years. Now it will make uh, us Nigeria today where we day. <laughs> We know what you mean. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this one is, my partner asked me why I love her and I could not give a definite answer. Should we have a reason to love a person? And if yes, if yes, what happens when she does not exhibit that reason anymore? Yeah, um, it depends on how you want to define love, but I think you should have things you like about someone. Um, it's very healthy, it's normal, it's good, because that's why, that's why this person is different from all the millions of the other people on the earth. There must be things you like as a person. Oh, I, you know, in fact, in, the book, in my book, Seven Questions Why Men Ask, it's one of the questions you should ask. Why me? Why do you want to marry me? You know, why, why, why did you choose me? Because that's very important. Somebody can just say, I choose you because you look like somebody that can pound the arm. <laughs> I'm telling you. I've heard all kinds of answers. I've heard all, trust me, that's why that book is there, Seven Questions Wise Women Ask. If you're a wise man here, you don't have that book, you're not being wise. Why me? You will hear all kinds of things. By their answer, you know if this person sees you as a person, sees your individuality, sees what's special about you. Because some people are married, you'll be amazed why people want to marry you. You will be shocked. You will be shocked. Some just will marry because, you know, this holiday period, they're not doing anything. <laughs> And I think you should just get married. I'm telling you, I've heard all sorts of things. So it's proper to ask that. Say, hey, why, why do you love me? Why do you think it's me you want to spend the rest of your life with? So um, there should be basic things. So what do you like? You know, it shouldn't be so artificial. It can't just be their looks. Now, their looks should be part of it. You should like how the person looks. But that can't be why you want to live with somebody, because their looks might change. Just like you asked at the end, that what if it changes? But you like their person, like their essence, like their behavior, like their character, like what they stand for, like what they want to be, like their vision, their passion, things like that, all right? Um, and from there you move on. But there should be definitely be things you like about this person. There are many men here. Why are you picking favor? Why are you picking John out of the thousands of men here or the thousands of women here? Why are you picking this one? There must be a reason why you are picking this person. All right? And, and again, some people have either too much criteria or too little criteria. There must be a balance. You should have enough proper criteria. When I want to pick a phone or a car or anything, if you see how much I research this thing, and I'm now shocked when I see people marry on that human being, no research, no study, don't know anything about the person, just say, yes, I do. With somebody you don't even know anything about. So yes, there should be things you like about the person. They should be more likely to be permanent things. In this way, they are not easy to change. So for instance, if I like that somebody loves God, that's not something that ordinarily should change with time. Ordinarily, if they love God, they should continue to love God. It's so that this person is wise. People don't just move from being wise to being foolish. It doesn't just happen overnight. Now, if I, if I say, I like your shape, I should like your shape, but that's not one of the strong foundations that will keep it married. Because if you're born twins, <laughs> if you give birth to three kids, most women won't remain the same. So does that mean I will not love you anymore? Things like you are my friend. That, that, that shouldn't get worse. Ordinarily, that gets better. If somebody gets what I'm saying. So it should be stronger qualities, not just artificial things. All right? Yes. Thank you, thank you. Round of applause, please. Thank you. 
Okay, so this one says. And sorry, you said I said what happens when it fades. Yeah. Um, most time, what what fades is not really the qualities. Most time, if it's, if it's the right qualities, what fades is the feelings. And again, I'm still trying to decide if that's what I'm going to preach tomorrow. What what happens with your feelings? Is that your feelings are never permanent. So you need to understand that. So this this is why people use the words like I don't love him anymore. There's no such thing. What you mean by that is that you don't feel loved anymore. You don't feel it. And feelings are never independent. They are always based on things. So if you go back to doing what you should do, your feelings will come again. One of the therapy we give couples most times when they marry and they have, they're now tired in the marriage, we ask them, when you were toasting this woman or when you were date, both dating, what were the things you were doing then? We try to bring their memory back. So there's a couple I cancelled recently. Um, the guy is a morning person, so he wakes up early. He wakes up like 3 a.m., 4 a.m. He just can't help it, no matter when he sleeps. He has been conditioned. He wakes up that time every day. The lady, on the other hand, usually is a night person, so she sleeps late like 12, 1 sometimes, and she you know, doesn't like to wake up early. So the woman has been complaining now that they don't talk, they don't spend time. And the guy was like, you, you in the morning when I wake up and I want to talk, like 5 a.m., you, you're, you're still sleeping, and you don't. And she said, if I'm sleeping, wake me up. The guy was like, I, I, I'll, I'll look wicked. I see how you're sleeping. I know, I know you slept late. To wake you up at 5 a.m. just to talk. And the lady said something that struck me. She said, but when we were dating, you used to come to my house at 5 a.m. Yes, I said wow too. <laughs> so their routine when they were dating was that the guy would come and take coffee in his house, in a house at 5 a.m. And she said, you wake me all the time when you come. Not that I'm awake that time. You used to wake me. See, that time the guy was pursuing the relationship. Now he no longer wants to pursue because men are hunters. Maybe I'm going to talk about that tomorrow. You need to understand how your, 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 your psyche works. So he needs to go back to what he used to pursue that companionship. That time he has to go back now and start pursuing the companionship. Do we understand? The love will come back. So nothing's wrong with the love. What is wrong with the love? All right, sir. Thank you. So here is the person asking. Um, you talked about perspective earlier. Yes. And this person is saying, your talk about perspective reminded her of someone she's in communication with. That's how it's put here. And he talks about how he wants to move out of the country. Yes. Now, traveling out is one part of her goals. But honestly, he isn't making any efforts to know more about her. All he talks about is what he wants. It's getting frustrating. And she just doesn't want to just tell him off. So what can she do? Let him know your concerns. Let him know your concerns. Many times we talk to every other person except the person we need to talk to. All right? Um, have a conversation. Tell him that, hey, you don't listen to me. I don't feel heard. I don't feel you connect with me. Let him know. If after you have those conversations once or twice and there's no change, he has answered you. He has already answered you. So don't, don't tie yourself there and want him to change. Again, that's what we do. We want this person to change. He has shown you who he is. He doesn't have time. He doesn't have interest. Somebody will like him like that. But if, it's not, if it doesn't work for you, leave him. You deserve someone that actually listens to you. It's a major need for you. If you compromise now and continue, it will get worse. Then you will now say you want to divorce. No. He has answered you. Have a conversation. If it's not changing, um, just fizzle out. Stop replying messages. You know, ladies, you know how you do it. Huh? <laughs> Yeah. What if one is dating a man that doesn't go to church but believes in God and prays? Mm, it's a big scam. There's nobody that really believes in God that doesn't go to church. It's just a scam. Um, when people do that, what they are trying to tell you is that they don't believe in spiritual authority. They are too religious or too um, self-righteous. They feel we in the church are too carnal for them. He will give you a problem. He will give you a problem. If you believe in God, it is God that said we should have church. Church is not Pastor Tunde's idea. Is somebody get what I'm saying? And one church is not PT's idea. The concept of church is not a human idea. It's the same God you say you believe in that said everybody should go to church. He said don't forsake the assembling together of the brethren. So um, he, must, he, he must belong to a, 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 a spiritual structure. He must. It's part of what Christianity demands, all right? Because if you go ahead and marry him, who will, who will, who will train your kids? That's what people don't think about. Do you know, most likely, even though there's a good part of you that would train your kids spiritually, but most likely other people minister to your kids. 
Everywhere I go, a lot of my friends' children always are drawn to me. They come to me. And I respect that because I know that there are things they might not be able to tell their dad. But they can tell me. Everywhere. I can't, even yesterday, I went to one of the big uh, marriage ministries guys' house um, event. His kids just came. They hugged me. Everything. They exchanged numbers. They said, oh, they love me. Young, young children. And I took it seriously because I know that their father is going about ministering everywhere. Somebody else needs to minister to their own kids. We are ministering to somebody's kids now. Somebody would minister to my kids. So that's why we must all belong to churches. We must all tithe. Because that's how we keep ministry going. So when you have people that have those mentality, I'm not going to go to I'm not going to tithe. They don't understand the global picture. Because somebody will minister to your kids one day. Two of you won't stay in that your parlor. Morning devotion is not the same as somebody teaching. It's like you saying you want to teach, teach, you call you a doctor, you want to teach your child to be a doctor without him going to medical school. It's doable, but that's not really how you know, doctors are trained. Same thing with your spiritual life. You can have more individual with your kids, but somebody needs to be in a church service and teach your kids the word of God. Let them mix with other Christians. And if you're not tithing, you're not belonging to a church, who is, who's going to do it? If everybody thinks like you, there will be no church. Do you understand? And the word of God is clear. If you really honor God, God himself has said, go to church. Belong to a church. If you don't like the church around you, find one. If you can't find one, start one. Yes, and the church mustn't have a big name and mustn't have a tent and a compound. It can be church in your house, but it has to be structured. There has to be structured teaching and ministering to people. And if it's being done well, it will outgrow that house and come to a tent. So you must be in the church last, last. <laughs> yes. Okay, so we have two more questions, so yes. we can round up. Mm-hmm. Um, we'll take one from a lady and one from okay. a guy, if that's fine. Okay, so this is from a guy. Is it okay to marry a woman with a lot of body count? Okay. That's the question. That's, oh, I thought that's there was it. more. We'll go to the end. <laughs> There's no rule. Um, all of us have done crazy things before we got married. Um, so I would even advise you, don't over-investigate those things. Human beings don't understand. Life, eh? You know, may God just be giving us wisdom on time. There are things people do that they think that is nice. You don't want to hear everything. Ah, I learned this one as a very young in the Lord. It's not everything you want to hear. There are things, the Bible says, guard your heart. It's you that will guard your heart. Many years ago, I had a staff that was to give us trouble in the office in, in, in when we were young ministry. Great, very gifted guy, but he was very troub- troublesome. After a while, we knew that we couldn't keep this guy. We had to let him go. So I told the my shit, shit pastor that was the admin, you have to let this guy go. So really give him a letter to let him go. So he, gave the, he fired the guy. And um, the next week or the next day, the guy wrote stinkers, letters to every staff in the church office. That's it's not just the pastor that fired him. Everybody, even you front desk, even everybody, you were, that, that nothing concerns you in the matter. You got a letter. So when I came to the office that next day, ah, they were all showing me the letter from front desk. So see, letter this guy wrote, so he blasted me. So everybody had a blasting letter. Everybody, I kid you not. We're not so much in the office then, but everybody had. So they now brought my own, that, uh, hey, this is the one he said we should give you. I took my own. Till tomorrow, I don't know what was in that letter. I took it exactly the way it was and put it in the dustbin. I didn't read it. Not just because what will be there will annoy me, but what will be there will poison me and affect me. If you think words don't count, you're joking. The whole Bible are words. That's what has kept this faith for two thousand over how many years. The words count. Words will affect you. When people talk about you, don't go ask what they say. If it's something negative, you don't even need to hear. It frees your mind. Because you hearing it, you will not be battling forgiveness. I didn't read that letter. Do you know what? Many years after that guy came back to do something with us as a church, everybody was struggling relating with him except me. I was the only one laughing with him. You know why I never heard what he said about me? Every other person was struggling. This guy that's I'm a fool. He's one that we're now doing something with. Everybody was struggling. I didn't have any issues talking to him because I never heard or read what he said about me. So if you want to marry somebody, check who they are today. Check if they've really disconnected from that past life. Don't go and ask them why. Give me all the list of all the men you slept and where you slept with them and what position you just tie. You don't need that information. 
Even though your mind is craving to know, trust me, it doesn't want to know. All right? Stay with the standard things. Are you still in touch with any of your exes? Have you broken up with these guys? Who are the ones I need to know about? Who are the ones I don't need to know about? That we never know. So basic stuff like that is what you need. So don't, so don't go and ask then, can you marry a woman with very good you, If she has changed, if she has changed today and she's a good woman and she's really healed from that lifestyle, there's nothing wrong with marrying her. You can even marry people that are single moms. You can marry any, those things are not, you can't use people's past to judge who they are today. Deal with who the person is and make sure they've actually cut off from that lifestyle. So that's where the issue is. Sometimes these people have not cut off from that lifestyle, from their old friends and from their old boyfriends. Those two people are the people Satan will use to drag them back into that lifestyle. So if they're really born again and they've cut off, then they cut off from the friends that carried them to that life or encouraged that life. Then they cut off from the men or women, depending on who you're talking about, that they were sleeping with. They need to cut off from Properly cut off, or that's block and delete. Yes, no connection of any kind. I see mad people these days, pity. People that are married and they're keeping touch with their exes that they had something physical with. That's the most stupid and, you know, inconsiderate thing you can do to your spouse. You are putting them under tension. And you can say, but my mind is clean, but you don't know what the other person's mind is. So for decency, for, for common sense, please, when you've had a history with people, you give them proper distance, okay? Keep it. Don't, don't, don't bring them back into your space. That's not healthy. All right? But you can marry this girl if she's a good girl. All right. Thank you very much, sir. Our very last question. Mm-hmm. So permit me. I'm going to ask two because there are Fire two down, people. I'm here. Yeah. Your, your rent is still yeah. counting. As long as I'm here, your rent so is there, still counting. There are two people that ask uh, similar questions. Mm-hmm. And I want to just ask two of them. Yes. So the first one says, my question is, why is it that married men are the ones that are so interested in me and the young men that come only come to play and have sex with me and go? That's the first person's question. And the second person says, I have ended three relationships because I felt guilty for having sex. Eventually, after avoiding it with the... Okay, for having sex, eventually, after avoiding it with the aim of doing things right. Now, the fourth, I had to quit because I needed to focus on my relationship with God. The question is, will I continue this circle or cycle of ending relationships for God? Am I being too hard on myself? It's difficult for me to lose, to lose guard because it's not easy to sin and forgive myself. Okay. Um, you're definitely being too hard on yourself Um, and there's no reason for you to be doing life alone somebody like you seems like you need accountability in your life don't do life, see there's nothing wrong with having weaknesses we all have weaknesses though the only challenge is that most of us don't want to submit that area of weakness to authority do you know God is more interested in you confessing to a human being than confessing to him most people don't know, most people think God is saying you confessing to him, confessing to him he knows he was there so you're coming to Christ and say, oh God, I come to tell you what I did yesterday. God says, see this one. I wasn't that there yesterday? I was there yesterday. The person you do need to tell is somebody that can hold you accountable. You see, that's, all, that's why we don't want to confess. Because secretly in our mind, we want to do it again. The day you're really ready to stop, eh? Come and tell somebody that can slap you when you want to go back there. Come and tell somebody that will say, are you, are you mad? You want to go and sleep where? That's the person you should tell. Not God. Because you know what? When you're going to do this, God won't stop you. You know that you can beg him. Yeah. You will be changed more by accountability to men than accountability to God. Mm-hmm. Everybody knows God is there, but it's not stopping anybody. Be accountable here on the earth, you will see. That's why mad women as mad, or mad men, as, even as they are mad, if they want to have sex, they still hide. They don't have sex on the express road. Because accountability to men is more solid. And that structure God put here is in Ephesians 5 or 6. Or 6. Also, he said, confess your faults one to another and pray for one another. Mm. There's only one place there's reference to confessing sins to God. Only one in the whole Bible, in the whole New Testament. And it was a specific people they were speaking to. So it's not even a Christian practice to be confessing your sin to God. He's not interested. The person you should confess to is to leadership, authority figures in your life. See, the day you tell your, somebody around you that you stole... You won't steal again. Because once they see you with new watch, they say, excuse me, <laughs> where did you get this thing? You won't steal again, trust me. But if it's this, this, this God, you cry, oh, oh, oh. Now, like, you go do them again. Tell
tell somebody that I'm following you. Say, where are you going, please? Where, where do you see how you dress? Say, so my sister, go inside. Somebody that can check your phone. That's why when I see people that they were cheating your relationship, your marriage, the way to solve it is transparency. By the time your spouse or whoever can see your phone all the time, even when the sister wants to tempt you, the person that will kill you is in front of you. <laughs> because we all get tempted, though. we all get weak. Accountability will save you. So, um, for you, that story I'm hearing, get somebody higher than you involved that can monitor your movement, uh, monitor your relationships. When you are starting a relationship, eh, all of us will have meeting. Not just you and the guy. Again, this is the thing I'm saying. If someone wants to date you, say, okay, my pastor would like to talk to you. A guy that is seriously won't mind. One of you sit down, we'll discuss it that. This issue of sex, what's your view? Ask the man. Put the microphone in his mouth. Tell us. <laughs> we'll all come to a meeting and we'll all walk towards it. And even if there are slips ups here and there, we'll, walk, we'll know how we're managing the situation and making sure it's not happening. So bring yourself out to, you know, it's like a surgery. You can't do it in here hiding. Somebody needs to operate on you. So come out, um, work together with the team. You need help. That's what I'm seeing from what you're saying. It's a cycle, and you can break it by bringing other people into it that will be accountable and pray with you. A prayer team, a prayer group, help you with the kind of men you are. I don't even know the kind of men you are in this relationship with. You know? And just because there was sex in a relationship doesn't mean it can never work. You just need to work on yourselves to make sure you're doing things right. Okay? It doesn't mean once, oh, the sex, that's why it's breaking. All right, so that's for that one. Then yeah, the other yes. one was um, the person who said that um, only married men show real interest in her, mm -hmm. and then young men only want to come and you know have sex. And hey, the married men too want to come and have sex with you too now. It's the same thing. <laughs> so basically, all the men coming now want to have sex with you. Well, again, sex is a major need for men. Like I said today, it's a major need. It's not something um, that is worried about per se. It's a major need now. Um, so I, I, I want to know two things. I hope you are not giving the body language. That is making people feel this is okay. There's a limit to how much you can stop people from approaching you. But again, you have a lot you can do. Those married men that toast women, eh, in many cases, they see the opportunity. There's a way you are playing with them that gives them the effrontery. Only very few are so mad that they will just see you and say, hey, girl, can you? Most ones will test the ground. They'll be like, hey, how are you doing? When you say, good morning, sir. Thank you, Mr. Dilly. How is uh, your wife? So what are you doing this evening? Ah. You two be with your wife. Yes, sir. There's, there's a language you will keep using. They will know that this person is saying, I know what you are thinking. And forget it. But you, I'm, sh I'm suspecting that you two are playing with it. Oh, is I? I am okay. How is your day? Don't give married men that kind of um, vibe at all. They pick up on it. They, they are not just coming. So make sure you're not giving any vibes by your attitude, by your dressing, by your lifestyle, that you, are, you can entertain that. There's a way you will be. They will just, they, it's not everybody they try it. See, and I've said this, men don't treat all women the same. You need to learn. Women, if that's the biggest, that's why you have a book titled Manual. Is there where I try to coach women about men. Men don't treat all women the same. Men treat women the way women allow them to treat them. So the same man can date one person and not buy her even, even recharge card and date on that person and buy her iPhone. Because one says, I'm not going to call you if you don't buy me a phone. And this other one says, don't have to buy me anything. I'm okay. I'm the one I'm even buying for you. I'm not saying you're going to be begging Ben. I'm just trying to say that men don't treat all women the same. We don't know what you want until you tell us and insist. Do you understand women? You're the one usually teaching men how to treat you. So you need to learn, all right? You need to learn. So don't give them the body language. And for the single ones to wasting your time, the, earlier, the quickly you know, see, this dating game is something you have to be doing fast. The faster you get people out of the way, you are seeing road. Uh, so, hey, how are you? Hi. Uh, can I get your number? Yes. I'll call you this night. Yes. I'm doing that quickly so that after this night, I know that I, will, I need to block you. <laughs> quickly. If I know that, oh, by, by one convention this night, I know that. This one. Now block and get you. So once you drop, I block you. Next person, next. <laughs> because the earlier we go through, we go meet the person who they find. <laughs> but some of you, you are taking too long. <laughs> you are taking two weeks to know that the guy is a loafer. No time. No time. Two weeks, two months to, to know he's a loafer. After eight months, you now find out, I don't think he's the type. Ah, eight months, two months. In eight minutes, you should know. You should have some key questions you ask. Stylishly, it's not like jam questions. It's not exam questions, but stylishly. 
So what are your own plans? Oh, what do you think about, do you go to church? Key three, four questions, you will know that this is the last conversation we are going to have. When he tries to call you again, say you are busy. When he sends you a message, he sends you a Monday, answer by Thursday. You have answered him. So go through the process quickly. Don't, 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 don't make a ceremony out of men wasting your time. You are in an open market. Do you know how many people enter a shop and don't buy? Imagine a store and are not complaining. People are passing. They are not buying. Is it by force? You always to display your goods. The right customer. Main 30 mad customers or wrong customers can pass. And the 31st one is the one we are waiting for. So the earlier those 30 pass, the better for us. Don't ask them say, why are you people not buying? Is it that the product is not good? Should we reduce the price? Let them be go, 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 go. That's the first one is what I'm waiting for. Yes. <laughs> okay, so, so people, yeah, um, Pastor Kingsley talked about how um, accountability to man is very important, right? Well, here we also believe that honor and respect for the men that God has used to bless us is very important. And so, if you feel blessed today, I want you to just join me, stand on your feet, and just honor the man of God today. Just... Just appreciate him for the time he has spent with us. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. It's an honor to have you here with us. God bless you. God Thank bless you. you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's Thank keep you. clapping to you guys. Thank please. you, guys. Thank you. Very much. Um, so, um, we'll be here tomorrow. Please tell anybody, tell your friends. It's going to be awesome tomorrow morning, two services. So, make sure you bring somebody and tell somebody. And um, I might have some minutes after the service to do to sign a few books for those that buy. So please, if you like us to sign books and maybe take a picture, we'll do that immediately after I have a few minutes to stay. Thank you. God bless. I'll pray with you tomorrow, please. So make sure you're in the service.